Okay, wonderful. So welcome to our second annual New Jersey Youth Transition Conference. My name is Dawn Monaco, and I'm here representing Span Parent Advocacy Network on behalf of the YTC Planning Committee. Hopefully everyone has started to take advantage of all the workshops we've had today. You were able to see our keynote speaker this morning, which was wonderful. Um, we will also place a registration form in the chat box shortly for you to share your contact information so that we can share the recordings and the resources with you um, from the workshops. And please note that for those who are seeking continuing education credit, you are required to complete that form as this is the contact method uh, in which you will be sent your proof of attendance. Today's uh, workshops will be hosted via the same link you have joined today. You can see the full schedule also on our website, and I will share the agenda on this screen after the conclusion of the workshop. Today we have uh, Michael Steinbrock from the Box Center. Um, he will be our presenter, and I do believe he has a couple other people with him. Um, presenting I do. In the wonderful. Um, he will be presenting on the topic of group person-centered planning in the classroom. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Michael to the group. Michael, I believe you have sharing capabilities if you have the PowerPoint or anything that you're going to be sharing. I love to share. I'll do a little of that for <laughs> sharing sure. Sharing is caring. <laughs> sharing is caring for sure. All right. So uh, thank you, Dawn. Um, for the introduction. And uh, so we have until 4.15. Uh, we're gonna keep things pretty uh, light and informal. I have, uh, I asked uh, a few schools to join me just to kind of share their experiences as kind of an informal panel. Uh, unfortunately, one had to cancel because of uh, illness. And uh, so we have my friend Ralph uh, from uh, Bergenfield, and also, I have uh, two folks coming from uh, Bridgewater Raritan High School. So these are both, uh, we work um, from ages 3 to 21, uh, but we have a couple of folks joining from the high school today. So just so you know, um, I'll just tell you a little bit myself very quickly. Um, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of information about our project. Um, I'll get through a bunch of other information, some helpful links, some training opportunities if you're interested in learning more, um, and also some information about if you wanted to uh, come on board this project as what, what we call a cohort um, school. Every year we have a group of schools that we work with intensively, and that's those are the folks that are gonna be joining on the panel. So again, um, my name is Michael Steinbrook. I work on uh, the PCAST project at Rutgers at the Elizabeth M. Bogg Center on developmental disabilities and PCAS stands for person-centered approaches in schools and transition. So we work in schools throughout the state, all kinds of schools at every age. Um, so as I said, three to transition to adult life, so three to 21. Um, we do have a number of ways of approaching our work and we have a tiered kind of system of support that we use. So I'm gonna kind of uh, go through that and I'll use a PowerPoint just to do that, but I'm going to try and stay away from the PowerPoints. I'll show you some examples of our work. I just want you all to understand what it is we do, what the approach is, have a general awareness so that you can make an informed decision if this is something you want to uh, attend training for or send others to attend training for, and, uh, and we'll go from there. So first, let me just test out to make sure um, I have my co-host here, Ralph, um, there. Ralph, can you uh, turn on your video? And uh, just so we can make sure we got you if we need you. Oh, there he is. Say hi, Ralph. Oh, and we have, um, and Sandra Lynch. You want to go ahead and test your video, Sandra? Just so we know, there she is. And, uh, and Brenda is uh, in transit getting uh, a little delay and she's getting to her um to her video so listen if you all i'm going to introduce you in a moment um i just want to make sure everything's working we'll wait for brenda to get here and i'll start by going through a little bit of project information just so we have a foundation and a context um, for you all to understand some of uh 
some of the information we're going to be reviewing. So first thing, um, introduction. So we have 47 people for that's wonderful. So Sandra and Ralph, if you can uh, you can shut off your video for the moment, and then uh, and I'll give you a I'll give you a yell when we're ready to get back to you. But I just wanted to make sure we had you and we're good to go. So thank you for that. Uh, so we have uh, getting close to 50 people here. So. I'm not going to do, uh, I couldn't do a round of introductions if I want to, but it looks like everybody could type in chat. Um, so I wanted to ask you all um, just in chat to, um, if you could tell me maybe, um, let's see, one thing that you really are proud of in terms of uh, something that you're particularly good at something, a word people would use to describe you, something people like about you, admire about you, or appreciate about you as a professional. So that could just a, just a one word in chat, just so, uh, and I'm gonna put one here for me. I am particularly fond of being creative as I can, when I can, dedicated, considerate. Um, keep, them, uh, keep them going. Everybody there? Got a few more words. I know. Uh, I know. Ralph and Sandra will will play along with me. So, um, so one of the things we tried to do. This is an example of a person centered approach, right? So this is uh, you. You know, building uh, planning on strengths and also using uh, positive conversation and strengths um, at, to you know kind of kick off lessons and other um, person centered planning events and classroom uh, exercises that we're doing. So one of the things that we know is that uh, every good plan, whether it's for a person, a person with a dis disability or not, um, a person in a school or not, an adult, or working with an organization, a group, a committee, you know, we're always going to, I think best practice um, calls for, you know, an understanding, a deep understanding of strengths. That's one of the key pieces to planning. I'm doing a strategic planning event action for a, a private company um, as a favor to a friend. And that's, you know, that's one of the exercises they're going to do is do a deep exploration. And that's not just like a SWOT analysis, which some people know about, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, but really a deep understanding and appreciation of our coworkers, of the of the business and other things. So um, so I figured we kick it off like that. And uh oh, Sandra's a fixer. I like that. All right. And so, um, so I'm not going to keep too close an eye on chat. So if anybody sees anything that I need to know, um, you, um, I think hopefully one of our, uh, you know, one of our um, moderators will call it to my attention. But I'm happy to um, address questions, and I'll try and uh, I'll try and keep an eye on it. All right. So real quickly, just to go over. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty fast because I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this. I'm going to share screen and I'm going to go to a PowerPoint and I just put a few things together for you as a quick overview to the project. So thank you for having me at the Youth Transition Conference. Uh, this is really a great resource. I'm really excited. I'm excited about the format that uh, it's accessible to a lot of people um, without having to drive and be in person. There's some benefits to that, certainly, uh, but also the collaborative nature of it, I, I really appreciate. So thank you, and thanks to all the uh, participating uh, organizations and folks, and thanks for letting us be here. Um, so the PCAST project, uh, first and foremost, is highly collaborative. This is not something where, you know, I sit in some office at Rutgers and come up with these practices and go out and preach them like gospel, but rather what we do is we participate in a community of practice, which I feel like I've really tried to do over the past you know, 30 years of my career, learning from people with disabilities, all people, family members, um, other professionals in all places, trying to get um, as best a handle on what you know, kind of promising practice are and best practices are and keep cycling the learning back. And that's the way we try to operate uh, in the state. That's the way this project operates. So we try to bring educators together, bring family members together, bring students together, and build a collaborative project where we can um, go out and explore the use of person-centered approaches in schools. And classroom work is a huge part of what we're doing because that's really the way we can kind of um, do work at scale. And I'll explain that a little bit. So if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. One of my favorite proverbs, um, 
And that's uh, exactly how we operate. So just real quickly, you've got your uh, our tiered uh, system here. Going to buzz through this. So the bottom, the widest part of this triangle, um, the place where we can provide the most information to the most people in the least time is through training. And so we have three principal trainings and also supplemental trainings that we do. But the three core trainings are um, person-centered planning and implementation, which anybody who's interested in this work, that's where we advise them to start. That's open to family members. It's open to educators. Um, and then that's a, that's a two-day workshop. I'll give you the link to that in a minute. Um, utilizing person-centered approaches to improve IEP meetings. So that's taking those skills and tools and strategies and techniques and uh, really thinking about how we can apply them in IEP, both the uh, IEP meeting and uh, the IEP process and pre-IEP meetings, and really kind of think about in, in the real world, when we back into what's actually possible and positive, what can we do in the time we have with the resources we have, and how can we kind of plan our way forward to kind of do more and implement and embed person-centered approaches um, as time goes on. So that brings me to the third training. Um, who knew? Developing group person-centered planning in classroom settings. So we can teach person-centered planning, um, and oftentimes in schools, the IEP process you know, may be pretty far away from what we would consider a person-centered process, um, not to paint with too broad a brush, um, but the IEP is a critical, um, a critical process, and sometimes it becomes more, serves more the system than the person. So that's sort of the balance we're trying to move further toward uh, getting to a place where all our IEPs, the all, all IEP processes are person-centered and really thinking about what that looks like and trying it out and working collaboratively with schools to kind of move forward. So because we can't have a person-centered plan with every individual on top of an IEP, um, we have to think about how we can also uh, get to scale in terms of making sure that students are uh, growing their own plans, taking ownership of their own plans, and having the support they need to bring them into things like their IEP meetings and have those drive conversations and drive discussions and have students increasingly participate and lead their IEP. So we really talk a lot about uh, facilitation and moving and moving that in. And we and one of the things we can do with classroom is have students work together, really have some lessons that also help to prepare them for IEP meetings and bring uh, and bring that information in. So in a lot of ways, person-centered approaches in schools starts to connect uh, areas that sometimes become siloed like teachers and case managers and the IEP and really kind of helping it become more of a, a healthy organism, I think, where people appreciate each other and the information flows better. And most importantly, the student becomes uh, more central to the process and really takes ownership um, as well as uh, more collaborative with families and more accessible to families. Um, so in addition to that, we do statewide presentations and workshops, and lo and behold, here's one right now that I'm doing. So I, uh, I highly recommend you come to training, and we, we would love to see you there. We have three full-time staff on the project, so we're not a huge project. We have uh, Valentina and Summerlee who also work um, throughout the state. So we do uh, pro provide support states statewide, and sometimes schools will ask for a day or two of a presentation or a demonstration or a little bit of short-term support, and that's the middle part of this triangle. And then lastly, and the, the bulk of our work is done at the top, right? So the top of that triangle is our cohort support. So every year, going back 10 years now, we have a group of schools that apply and are selected to participate in the project where we spend time throughout the year in multi-year um, support on-site um, in schools. So we... Um, do more intensive work depending on where the school is. So we can, we don't want to bite off more than we can chew. We just figure out, you know, we want to do, we, we do a lot of work through demonstration. So we want to demonstrate and come in and not just do trainings or presentations like this one, but also demonstrate person-centered planning. So we um, facilitate plans, we train facilitators, we can train trainers, we can help develop customized training. Um, and we also push into classrooms to support and collaborate and partner with teachers and paraprofessionals to really develop um, approaches within a given uh, classroom 
um, just around classroom-wide person-centered approaches, but also specific lessons that will help build and populate um, and, and gather deeper and richer information into person-centered plans that can then, as I said before, you know, be used in everyday supports and be ac accessible to everyone and also be used in IEPs and other community-based instruction um, at home or uh, community, wherever the student or family feels in, uh, that it will be helpful. So that's, uh, so that's something that happens and there's a, a broadcast that goes out from the New Jersey Department of Education every year uh, in April and uh, or maybe April, yeah. So, and then if you, that'll come through directors of special services and superintendents offices. And if a school is interested, they can apply. And then we have, you know, a certain amount of capacity to add schools every year. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, this is a person-centered plan if you haven't seen one before. Uh, this is one example of one container. So this particular type of plan, we have on one piece of paper. So it is really about um, some critical and key information, not every detail, not exhaustive, but the, the cream of the, you know, the cream on the top, the really key information you want to know about someone in six sections. And I'll just tell you what they are. Um, great things about the person. So their gifts, their capacities, their interests, their passions, their skills. Um, those are the things we wanna capture. This is a student that I worked with, uh, Raimundo, and this is his plan. Uh, Raimundo happens to not use many words to, uh, to communicate. So there are ways that we facilitate and we teach facilitation so that a person can really find their voice through person-centered planning. Same thing happens in the classroom as it does with individual plan so that we facilitate, but we use facilitated conversations to dig down to understand what's the most important to the person and have best supports for people, uh, for the individual person. Whereas um, sometimes we hear that accommodations and modifications that are drawn from kind of pre-banked options in, a, in software and in an IEP may not always be accurate. And this is a way to really be very specific, to have something that's uh, kind of ready, ready to read and can be uh, added to and shared uh, if a paraprofessional is out for a week um, or you know, a substitute teacher is in for maternity leave, things like that to really understand and hit the ground running in, in classroom supports, but also supports throughout the, any school. All right, so then in addition, we have our, um, and I see Brenda's joined us, excellent. Um, so we have inf key information on communication, uh, vision for the future and action planning. So all of this information, understanding the student builds our understanding of kind of the now, as we might call it, right? So before we get into uh, kind of helping the student create a vision and, and having a shared vision with his or her team for the future, and then backing out of that to understand what are the things to prioritize, what are the things to focus on, what are the things that uh, may be in the way of that vision or the strengths that need to be enhanced um, to make that student as likely to be successful all the way through their education and, and to have their post-school outcomes um, achieved and to have the best life they can in the communities where they want to live. So that's what a person-centered plan, one, one type of person-centered looks like. There's different you know, containers that you can put the information in. Um, but this project, uh, we do, we teach facilitation and planning. We do classroom implementation, which we're going to talk about in a second. And we have um, kind of moved both of those things into the IEP process. And we've done that through the pandemic virtually. Um, I like to use graphics. So these are some of my graphics just to kind of help people get their heads around it. And, uh, and that's kind of, those are, the, those are the big ticket items, the things that really define uh, the project. Um, so, you know, we may, if we're facilitating a plan with a student it may look like this and we teach a, kind of a different model to different vision of how to plan so that we can back into, how can we bring that into the classroom? How can we bring that into an IEP? How does that translate? What things can we glean from that process? If you think about that person-centered plan I showed you and say it was made of rubber, I tell people if you were able to stretch that across, you know, weeks or months in the classroom, you know, we have lessons that we have um, co-created with schools throughout New Jersey over the last 10 years that we can, um, we can facilitate and draw information down and synthesize down into that person-centered plan, almost like a bucket capturing that wisdom and that knowledge throughout, throughout the time that we're spending on those lessons. And there's lessons that address 
any, all of, any and all of those uh, sections of the person-centered plan. So again, these are things that we do in the classroom and, uh, and also in IEP meetings. And here is uh, just a couple of pictures from some of our classroom work. And again, we're working in schools throughout the state. Uh, we have Bridgewater with us and, and uh, Bergenfield, but um, I'm in, you know, I'm kind of working in probably about 26 different schools. Um, so every school imaginable, um, urban districts, uh, rural, uh, regional schools, um, all kinds of different places. So, um, and again, I mentioned the training, and so in the end, we really try to help, uh, uh, you know, individual professionals and parents and students kind of see themselves more clearly um, through person-centered practices and also see the possibilities and maybe see a little farther. So create a little positive tension between where we are and where we want to get to. And that's kind of gives you an overview of, um, of the work that we're doing. So that said, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to ask, uh, we already have Brenda on board here. Can we get Ralph and Sandra up? And, uh, and you, got, you all can unmute. And it's go time, 3.20. So we got, we've got a good amount of time to chat. Um, I'm going to take, uh, well, as you're talking, I'll be able to look a little more closely into the, uh, the meeting chat. If you all um, have a question, you can put it in the chat. So let me... Uh, let me just buzz through here. So while I'm looking through this initially, why don't we go from Sandra to Brenda and then to Ralph. And if you all could just tell me um, who you are, what you do, uh, what school you're in uh, in your role. And uh, maybe one thing you appreciate most about person-centered practices, but not too long because we have lots of time to talk. So Sandra, go ahead and then Brenda. And Brenda, would you mind just, can you know how to, I'll change it for you. I'm gonna change your name. Um, just so, oh, it doesn't look like I can. Maybe you can. If you go up to the three, if you put your cursor over your window, your face, you'll see a blue thing up the upper right with a few dots, and it should let you rename yourself so we, so people can see your name. Uh, but go ahead, Sandra. Okay, so I'm Sandra Lynch. I am the transition coordinator for Bridgewater Raritan Regional School District. Um, I started doing the PCAST training and working with Michael several years ago at this point, what I enjoy most is seeing that full transition of centering the students and then the language that the students bring to their program planning. All right, thank you. And Brenda. You're muted, you're Brenda. Mute. Yep. You um, can Brenda leave yourselves Hopkins. unmuted if you want. Yep. <laughs> I teach um, students with special needs at Bridgewater Raritan High School. I mainly have a um, career and community exploration class. Uh, we go out into the community and volunteer in different businesses. I also teach life skills and related instruction. Um, and I think what I really love most about PCAST is everyone's involvement. Um, I love hearing from the TAs, the speech teacher, um, the, the head teacher, Michael's input, Sandra's input, um, because sometimes we just have our blinders on and we just teach what we teach and we don't see the kids in these other dimensions throughout their day. So I just love that every, it's a full on, hands on, all hands on deck kind of <laughs> program. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Brenda. And Sandra and Brenda have been uh, amazing to work with. And actually, I've been so many different schools with so many teams. And I just find, uh, you know, with the person-centered uh, approaches that we uh, try and, you know, kind of grow together, so many amazing educators uh, working. I, you know, I'm very lucky. You know, you know, sometimes we're working in some pretty tough places and some pretty tough situations. But always, you know, the the educators and the paras and the families and the students really coming together is uh, particularly rewarding for me. I love being in a different place every day. So, but I'll talk about that later. Ralph, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ralph Dukowitz. I'm the transition counselor for the school district of Bergenfield. I am a teacher, a special ed teacher. I am a community social worker and a former adjunct instructor for Seton Hall. Uh, I became involved with, with uh, 
PCAS, luckily, uh, probably around 2017 or so, we applied for a Department of Education grant, uh, which was in particular, uh, one of the rules was, uh, which was one of the, the highlights of, of my program, uh, it, we were doing an 18 to 21 program and part of the foundation was to be based in PCAS. Uh, prior to that, I was lucky to see Michael at a ASPE working, uh, workshop, ASPE work, uh, workshop years ago. And I was fascinated by putting papers on the board. Some gentlemen tell me that humor, humor, humor is important. Um, I put my computer away. I thought it was, thank goodness. Um, so it just like drew me into it. And ever since then, um, I, I see the benefits of PCAS built on a positivity firm foundation. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful process that isn't over when you get done with it. It's just a, a living document that goes on and on and on. All right. Well, thanks for the high praise, Ralph. And uh, so it. just... Just so you all know, this is, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a couple schools to give some perspective here, um, but I really could have drawn on any number of people and then any number of different schools. Um, so I kind of put the call out and these, these folks were kind enough to, uh, to, to volunteer. Um, so I really appreciate you all being here to kind of answer some questions. So I will take, um, I'm not real good at presenting and keeping track of chat, but I'm going to make an extra concerted effort to do well at it today. So I'm going to be looking at my meeting chat. And if you have a question and if you wanted to ask a question anonymously, I think you can uh, ask directly or you can send it out to everybody and I should be able to, I should be able to see both. Um, but before we get to some of those questions, I just wanted to, um, and we have a, somebody ask about transition coordinators. I will address this question because I know we have two that that's put one of the, at least one of the hats that you all wear. So um, between Sandra and Ralph, um, maybe, I don't know if it's still titles or not, but I know it's uh, kind of in, in your wheelhouse. Um, but I think that uh, somebody had mentioned that they've really found a real mixed bag when it comes to, you know, the experience and training and approaches with transition coordinators. And so I would say this just really quick. One thing, the only, you know, I can't really speak to, you know, if what inconsistencies there may be without the state, throughout the state, but like all things, you know, training is really important and having, being part of a community where, we can challenge each other's thinking and support each other's thinking through a community practice is always critical. So I would say two things is that um, if you have staff uh, in that role or any role that we can help through training, um, we would absolutely encourage you to register. And again, I will give you that link in a second. Um, but also to, you know, when you become part, become, you know, join those trainings, or maybe become part of a cohort, you become a much more wider uh, community of practice. So that's something where we can really support people because sometimes even people who kind of want to do some of these things might have a hard time if they're kind of going to training and coming back to a place where, you know, it's hard to get, you know, the, the, the inertia, the momentum is moving, maybe not in quite that direction. So we um, can really kind of support them through that so they're not alone in it. Um, Sandra and Ralph, are, and you all kind of had those roles, right? So what are the things that you, you think has, have helped you um, the most over the years in terms of moving in the directions that you've been moving with regard to person-centered practice? Um, I feel like I've always kind of looked at student first. When I started my career, I was working for an urban district where the student was their own parent and they had to learn how to advocate for themselves and uh, find what they needed because they were their biggest supporter, um, which then just kind of rolled into me doing this um, and building programs designed around student centeredness, um, student outcomes. I recently did an outcomes-based research project to see what was going right in schools to what was could be fixed in schools, um, taking that and adding that into our programming here and building additional programs, additional uh, 
classes and writing curriculum for them where Brenda and I are currently on a curriculum writing team and bringing PCAST into our um, day-to-day curriculum. So it's being absorbed more and more by the masses on campus, but I think it's ultimately um, where everyone needs to be, you know. And, and, and certainly that, you know, you know, I've certainly been working in quite a number of districts over time and uh, it's, it is a real mixed bag. So there's, uh, there's some, you know, many districts in really difficult situations that are doing amazing work. There's some that are, you know, have a lot of resources that may not be really pursuing it. So it's really, it's, it's, or the opposite. So it's really kind of hard to judge. Yep. I think we're Bridgewater, where we're very, where the huge benefit at Bridgewater right now is that I am a transition coordinator. I am an educator, but I do not have a classroom of students. So my schedule is really focused on that, not only just building programs for students, but teacher training, uh, parent training. Um, I run fairs to bring people together, to bring all those entities outside of the school into one room for families and for students. Um, so it's a blessing because it sounds like Ralph is dual, meaning he's, he's the transition, he's got a transition name, but he's also the Brenda of the, the school as well. So I think he's, he's, he, he is uh, here. The two of us he, combined. Yes. he is here with both hats and he's, and he actually, uh, does apply to work in classroom, but go ahead, Ralph, did you have anything you wanted to add? I don't know how to follow that one. I have to say, I just said that, uh, you know, I, it, it's, you know, it's so great. I, I think the uniqueness of what we all do is so wonderful because the outcome is what we're all trying to do is help the students to move on to transition to the real world and and i think to me it's just a logical logical process that doing pcas in a school and when the student graduates they do person-centered or maps or paths, which is under the umbrella of person center. So why other, not, other styles and, and processes right. for, to do the same thing. Why, why not do it now while, while they're in school? Um, and I love hearing the great creative things that your school districts do, are all doing. That's wonderful. Uh, just great. So. Yep. Awesome. And just so um, just so you know, and then I'm going to ask Brenda a question. Uh, I put um, our link to training in the chat. So Again, they're just like I showed you on that tiered system, we have three uh, principal trainings and the one that I always recommend is to take them in this order, which is to uh, take the person-centered planning and implementation implementation training. These are free trainings open uh, to anyone who's connected with the uh, education system in New Jersey, and that includes families. So I highly encourage families that can attend um, to be there because that really improves the experience for the educators that are there. So um, so take a look at there and you will see uh, what offerings we have for the fall that are on there. And then also we will have additional trainings in the spring starting in January. And we may be moving uh, back to in-person. So the, the, there are different locations, including uh, the New Jersey Department of Education's um, Learning Resource Centers. Um, but you can find the locations uh, when you register. And the other thing I wanted to mention is to, I'm gonna share the Department of Education's website um, where they have a transition toolkit. So that's something that also can be shared with your transition coordinators and all educators um, because there are other, um, uh, you know, kind of opportunities, training opportunities and information there that you can access. So that's that's a great resource. And one other thing I wanted to mention about our uh, training is that we're working on uh, some additional, we're expanding things that really merited their own uh, kind of uh, module or workshop. So we're expanding some work around uh, supported decision-making as an alternative to guardianship. We're also uh, have something that we're gonna be launching uh, called culturally responsive facilitation in person center practices, which really applies you know, that includes IEPs, right? That's a, IEP should be a person-centered practice um, and classroom work. And then also we're going to, um, there's one other one. Oh, we're going to be doing some, uh, that's gonna be a little further out, but just expanding thoughts on supporting people who don't use words to communicate, may not use augmented communication devices. So, and, and how we support them 
in-person center practices, because a lot of these practices were actually originally developed specifically to do that. So we want to make sure that people understand um, how to do that. And I can certainly speak to that and how I approach that in classrooms as well. When we have students who may not be able to kind of share directly or self-report or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so let's ask a question. Um, and I'm just going to keep an eye on things. Um, wow, we got 50 people. That's awesome. Uh, all right. So um, why don't we talk, I'll start with Brenda. Brenda, can you talk a little bit about just describing um, whether you did it, do it with me or it's something else you're doing, how do you apply and implement person-centered approaches in your classroom? What have your experiences been? And uh, Sandra, you can chime in, but I want to give Brenda a chance. Well, you were coming in pretty much very consistently um, the second half of the year. So I liked how we established that routine and we brought in a bunch of students from different classes so that we were able to kind of hit all different types of um, levels. You know, we had some students in there that were nonverbal, and then we had students in there that were resource room kids. So it was a really interesting mix. Um, so that's one approach is to, you know, kind of bring students together for uh, moving through a PCAST kind of project within the school and we can adapt and accommodate to different groups. And then in other cases, we simply go into existing, you know, classrooms, you know, whatever, whatever they are, but go ahead. I think what was really important about that group last year was I had many of those students in middle school and in high school. So we were really able to kind of get super deep with with some of those post grads um, and I think it was important because some of those post grads didn't come back and now they have that person centered plan. Um, I think it's really important that at the end of the year that each student goes home with a hard copy of it just because sometimes we don't know what's going to happen over the summer or maybe there's a move or you know, a kid decides not to come back after being out for, you know, being a post-grad. And what happens is then that student is cut off from the district email. So if you don't have your printed version of your person-centered plan, when you're leaving in June, um, you know, then, then you may not have access to it if you're not going to get back in touch with myself or, or Sandra. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I thought about, obviously, to, once, uh, once it was too late. Yeah, sure. um, but I well, realized, you know, some yeah. of our kids can't get back into their accounts. And um, I was just hoping that everyone had had that finished product. So I think yeah. it's important, you know, to make sure, you know, just our mindset that everyone goes home at the end of the year with that, that printed copy. And, that, and that's why that kind of, uh, thoughtfulness in terms of not just, you know, kind of we do lessons, we create plans, but the most important part is what do we do with those plans? What, how do we embed this into our practices? How do we make sure that the student, you know, kind of owns that plan, the family has that, that person-centered plan, and that we're honoring it and implementing it, you know, ongoing. So um, the fact that they do own it, they, they absolutely must have a copy of it, but also we need to make sure that it's accessible to people who touch that student's life in any school. So if we don't have some central place that people can access it, including paraprofessionals, you know, that's the whole point. So we always talk about, you know, person-centered plan is not an outcome, right? And a plan is and should be a promise. So if, we, if we're going to go to the trouble of creating one, and, and, you know, obviously it has its benefits in the classroom regardless, but if we then don't use it, it you know it really is about you know kind of saying, hey, we really want to help you create this great plan that then we're going to put in the Manila folder and or you know put in an inaccessible shared drive that Paris can't get to or something like that doesn't doesn't make sense. So that that's kind of some of the uh, really the more organizational change that needs to happen to make sure it's accessible. Sandra, did you want to? Yeah, I just there are two two things that kind of popped into my head as Brenda and you were speaking. The, the Manila folder. I think Brenda and I's first lesson before Michael came into the classroom was really 
kind of like Michael did at the beginning of this and asked for one word to describe you. So we, everyone got their manila folder, like Michael said, and we did a classroom gallery walk and each student's folder was label and each one of their friends, teachers and assistants wrote what they admire about that person on their folder. And every time PCAST lesson started and they were handed their folder, they were reminded of all the amazing attributes. So it could have turned their day around. And actually it was a Monday that Michael came in. So Mondays are Mondays. And if you look out your window right now, they're sometimes gloomy. But when you see all these amazing things about you on your desk and they're welcoming you in a Monday morning, I think that's amazing. The other thing, as Brenda said, knowing the students for years, these kids are in classes together for years upon years upon years, and they know each other so well. Their best days, their worst days, and they can share with their peers how it makes them feel or how we can do better. How can I support you? Sometimes they support each other better than we do, and we just kind of say, "What did you just say there? Like, how do how did you how did you do that?" So I think it's really tapping into the knowledge they have. A lot of them have been in class together since three years old, and now they're 18, 19 years old, and they're each other's best friends. Yeah. And worst enemies, we know. Yeah. <laughs> and that, and that's, and that's part of the, that's part of the sort of innovation and, and challenge of classroom work is because if you, if we had the resources, if we could have a person-centered planning event for every individual student and their team. We certainly, we certainly would want to do that, but it's not, it's a critical, uh, uh, you know, kind of approach to have in your toolbox. It's a critical um, approach to have as a reminder of what we really need to be doing and, and to remind, you know, people when we go into, you know, the planning that we have to do, that we need to kind of bring in as much of that as possible. Um, but we can't, but when we're in the classroom, we don't have all the people the student may have identified, you know, to have in their person center plan. We don't have the family there, right? So the other, um, there's opportunities there. There's opportunities for students to learn skills as they really think about um, and share their insights and appreciations of each other and really helping them grow in that respect. Um, and also um, teaching person centered thinking skills to teachers and paraprofessionals because moving through these lessons, it's not just about the students, it's about all of us. So it's about, um, learning to approach the work differently, to think about supports differently, and to think about um, students as humans, as people, and uh, to kind of create, creating plans really kind of changes your uh, perspective on that. Um, Ralph, did you want to talk about some of the work you've been doing up in Bergenfield? Yeah, I'd love to. I'm going to almost piggyback on Brenda and Sandra. It was really interesting that you set this up, so to speak. Um, one of the things we had a young man who was very much interested in participating in, in person centered and unfortunately he was he was living with his aunt and uncle dad was a little estranged a little bit so we found out some information that his love of soccer uh and i am a frustrated art therapist so what i did was i drew a uh five foot picture uh five foot picture of a soccer player that looked a little bit like him a little bit uh, and what <laughs> happened was using the principles in the toolbox of uh from do uh doe in the toolbox of person centered all of us wrote into this soccer player um uh, and we filled it in and it was interesting everyone who knew him came in speech therapists family members who knew him from our other students wrote upon it uh, now again, this is this was approval of him, of course, was a confidentiality, uh, and it was fascinating to build a picture of who he was. And similar to what Brenda said, uh, we were able to compile at the end of the year a profile of him. And one of our IEP meetings, he was 20 years old, and he didn't come back. One of the things I laid out was the AmeriCorps, and. Um, the family took him from us and he went to AmeriCorps, which was great. That's his choice, his family's choice. And that was an interesting, but he had a hard copy of just a little bit of who he was or who he is always. So I thought that was great, all, how it all fit together. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Ralph. Um, so one of the questions I think it might be helpful is um, what, 
what was the student reaction to some of this work that was happening in the classrooms? What, what have you all been saying? And I know, Sandra, I've worked with you um, with other teachers at Bridgewater Raritan, um, you know, different student groups. And so any, any of you all just uh, feel free to talk. And uh, I see Brenda's head shaking, but uh, you want to start, Brenda? And we'll go from there. I like chaos, so just talk whenever you want. Okay, you have to repeat the question because there were so, people oh. in, my, in my world here. I can, so maybe you I were talking, start. maybe you're shaking your head at your husband. Like, <laughs> yes, yes, go away. No. I'll start real quick. So we're talking about, Brenda, what you noticed in the classroom as uh, you started introducing those lessons. What I, by the teachers, and what I found, the people that used to come to me after the lessons were the TAs not just the teachers. Mm -hmm. um, not only that, the TAs, when you have what, what this isn't part of this, but a full PCAST meeting, this two hour long meeting, and the, the district allows time of release for teachers and TAs if invited by the student. And they say, I've never been invited to meetings like that. We've had cry sessions, just happy cry sessions about students with TAs and just amazing meetings that I think yeah. The buy-in from not just the teachers instructing it, but all the teaching assistants that watch the joy on the face of the students and the in, the independence grow is amazing, I think. Yeah. that's And I think that plays over, Sandra, that's a great point. It plays over into the classroom, too, because when you are doing this work, it can be transformational for you as a professional, right? So we have... Anytime I am asked to come in um, and I do, you know, I may do uh, some professional development or work with um, paraprofessionals, teachers, assistants, that kind of thing. So appreciative and, and really working um, oftentimes in a system that doesn't necessarily make room for or value their perspectives or help them through the process of really seeing things through a person-centered lens, which when that happens, makes you really brings out the art in the work that you're doing really and and really makes that work so much more rewarding so much more effect effective and impactful so i hear from paraprofessionals all the time and when we're doing classroom work which is what we're here to talk about today um they're without them you know this can you know when you start getting in some of these you know kind of deeper level conversations their insights are invaluable and they're incredibly um, appreciated by the students that we're working with. And for some of the students who have more significant support needs and may not be able to um, share directly, you know, it's the, it's hearing and, and it's, it's the um, receptive um, kind of understanding of what's being said, but also just having their supports um, more aligned with who they are and what works better for them, even if they can't really understand some of those things that are being talked about. So those are really critical um, observations. Um, Brenda or Ralph, did you wanna share a little bit about some of your student reactions? Ralph, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'm i an old hippie from way back when who's lost his hair, but <laughs> uh, I, so I'm a real you know, flower child, but you know, it was mentioned before, I, the atmosphere in which is created in the room Traditionally, the IEP at times has been er adversarial, so to speak. Um, to have a parent leave, and I think Sandra mentioned it, with tears of joy because she heard such compliments and wonderful things that she may never have heard about her child and say, wow, this is so great. And students that will say, wow, I never knew that about myself. Thank you. Um, it, it's an interesting psychological atmosphere that's created in a beautiful way. It really is. Yes. It doesn't negate the challenges, but accentuates the positive and builds upon that. Yeah. And that, can I, just, and that, can that I add to that real quick, Michael? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. I just, same thing, Ralph. We had a meeting once and this, this uh, one of our students, his father travels an immense amount for work. Um, and he happened to be home when we had the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, he yeah. said, I'm, thank you. I met my son again today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. I, right. remember that. I remember that experience and that, yes. that what I was gonna say to Ralph and I'll say the same thing to you is those profound, the impact can be profound even from you know, a person-centered planning event you know, where we facilitate a plan. 
but the but the same things can happen in the classroom in terms of yeah. teachers and paraprofessionals or teachers assistants, whatever whatever term we're using, um, really come to understand and see the students are working with very differently, right? Through a person-centered lens instead of a, a more system-centered lens, right? So it's not, these are, these are students, human beings who are whole and complete, right? Who come to us with gifts. And if we're gonna support them, we have to know, we have to know them, we have to know who they are. We can't look that, at people through a system, through a disability only lens, right? So you're this, you know, you go here, you know, we do this from the menu kind of thing. So it's really a very different, um, paradigm. And that's what we talk about um, in training. Um, sorry, Ralph, did you want to say something else? Or no, I think good? that was covered. Brenda, any yeah. thoughts or reflections um, on student I reaction? Yep. I, I really like how, you know, when you do come in, Michael, it's, you know, the adult egos are left at the door and, and we dive into our students and um, you know, sometimes there would be times, Michael, that you would pick up on a student's um, message and then we would piggyback off of each other or it was a tag team. And um, I really like how the TAs get involved because they see the kids more than anyone. They see them in yeah. the most situations than, than all of us, you know, put together. Um, sure. So their input is super important at that point, and it's a great way for them to feel valued, and um, and it's important for the t educators to see those relationships between the TAs and and the students. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you a quick story. I was just uh, up in Union City, um, where I'd done work for a couple of years, and I was working with one teacher right before the pandemic, and a little bit virtually during the pandemic, but like last year, apparently my emails were getting uh, tucked in, tucked away or blocked by the server or tucked in spam or something. So anyway, I was, I didn't do a lot of work there and I was, I was a little worried. I was like, oh, you know, are we gonna, am I gonna, you know, I'm just wondering what's going on in that district and this and that and the other thing. Cause I remember when I started with that teacher, she, at first she was like, um, and we were laughing about it when we were there, but she was like, you know, isn't that like, that's like psychology or, you know, something like, or, you know, this or that. I said, no, 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 this is just getting to know people. You know, this is really <laughs> just, you know, ways to facilitate conversations to understand who a person is so that we can support them well and we can teach them better. Right. And so I went there with my colleague um, the other day, Union City, awesome Dominican food, by the way. So happy to be back there. And um and she came in and she's been, she's just like exploded with the work she's been doing in her classroom and kind of brought all these things into this meeting. Um, and I just, and it really, she said, she, it just kind of opened her eyes and she realized it wasn't that she didn't have that capacity, right? It was just, it was the lens, right? It was like, this is how we were looking at things. And then she realized, oh, there's, a, there's just a whole nother way to approach things and it's not, and, and our roles are just as important and critical. It's not like our jobs aren't gonna be there, right? It's that, it's that there, we can do them more effectively and, and more, um, uh, you know, kind of really have that kind of profound impact that you all are talking about over time. So let me, um, we get about 25 minutes. And again, if somebody has, I'm getting a lot of nice comments from folks uh, privately, um, appreciations, I appreciate that. Um, is there, uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Oh, the other thing I wanted to just mention real quick before I ask this, because I wanted to ask about just things that you're seeing over time, results, you know, in students, that kind of thing, or parent or family members, right? So, but one of the things is we see students and how they are reacting to this kind of um, these approaches and this kind of support when they've encountered it for the very first time, right? So that's a snapshot of when we go into school and here we are delivering per some person-centered approaches, person-centered supports, person-centered planning, helping people understand person-centered thinking. But, but I always tell people, imagine if, if this had been happening since you know early intervention or pre-K, if these were the conversations, as this was the, the manner of facilitations in our interaction with family members, that where might those, our relationships be with those family members? Where might 
those students be in their ability to really participate and self-advocate and be a part of their IEPs and lead their IEPs. Because we're doing work now in elementary uh, grades where you know, uh, districts are supporting students to lead their IEPs, you know, well before the transition age, as opposed to just attending. So we want to maximize their participants, you know, their participation, but also take ownership of those things, because especially those students who are going to be supported in the adult world through divisional developmental disabilities or other um, supports, you know, it's critical that students be able to sort of take that central role, talk about themselves more comfortably in a group, talk about, express their preferences or us understanding how to get to those things. So that's, uh, so that's important. So that having said that, um, I don't know, Ralph, what are, you know, what are the results you've seen? There's got to be a reason you keep, you know, schools keep doing this kind of work, right? Yeah, most you definitely. Know, you see? Yep, go ahead. You know, what we're trying to do in Bergenfield is almost establish a, a, a what I call a PCAST community of, of parents so they can be a, a liaison for me and what we're doing. Um, it, it's great that we, the professionals, are kind of spreading and practicing the principles, but I, I, I think it becomes real that that one family tells another family or one student says, hey, did you ever do that person-centered thing? I got some free food, I love the music, or all of the above, so to speak. Um, and we're trying to use all the tools that are out there to us. So uh, parents, we're trying to push, push, push at parent meetings, to, uh, because this is a precursor when they leave us, that they're gonna yep. have person-centered, so. Yep. And, and it's less an indicator, uh, this, what I wanted to share than an outcome, but they, I know that it's such a frequent occurrence that because students, when they're having a person center plan, you know, if they have a, a you know, kind of a facilitated plan, it, when they invite their, their classmates into those, um, that, you know, kind of getting the tug on the shoulder asking, you know, uh, can I have a, can I have a, when's my meeting? You know, what can I have a person center plan? And that, I don't know how often that happens to you all in, yeah. in our typical planning processes, but um, you know, from what I hear, not often, right? As you know, so it's so when you have that kind of result, when a student wants to be a part of a process, that's you know, that's student engagement. That's what we're that's what we're shooting for. Um, Sandra or Brenda, do you have do you want to talk a little bit? I know Sandra, that's kind of yeah, your so baby think, outcomes, um, right? <laughs> to, to jump piggyback on the uh, how this informs the IEP meeting. Um, so if you, if you kind of look at all the lessons, once you get into the lessons um, about the classroom-based planning and how it could look in the classroom, Brenda would do a lesson. She, the good kids would fill in their working document. They would do another lesson. They would update their document. So, so all year long, they had this document that grew and transformed and grew and transformed. And then whenever their IEP meeting was, they would print it off and they would highlight what they wanted to share at their meeting. So they had a script for those that are uncomfortable taking control of that meeting in front of them. They had their comfort, they knew it, they worked on it every week and they would go into their meeting and they would speak for themselves. And we are steadfast in ensuring that their person-centered plan informs goals and objectives to be written into that document. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what that means, either in speech, the speech therapist is always there. Like I can take that one, we'll work on this, or I'll do this one and we'll work on that. And it, it really is, um, they see, okay, well, you said that, you know, one of our students, because he brought his and spoke up and said, I wanna try um, Woods, he's taken a Woods one class this year, unsupported. We don't even have a TA with him and is hitting the ground running once he passed the safety test yeah. anyway. Um, the other thing, We've invited DDD uh, support coordination agencies in. I don't, you know, when when parents get to that level, they need a person-centered plan. It's part of DDD's requirements. It's done. So now we're ready to go. We've met with support coordination agencies during their 21st, 22nd year. We present it. They have it. So, you know, I'm, right before COVID, we I saw the closest to non-stop services from graduation to adult services. We hit a hiccup with COVID, but it's, it's, usually, it's usually a big gap in between those two. We had gotten to the point where they were literally Thursday, Monday. I'm hoping to get there again, but uh, 
you know, we, we're doing work, not just for them now, it's for them later. And it's, it's a working doc. I always send a doc, uh, an editable doc to their family. So they have it, can adjust it as needed. They have their working doc. Um, it's just so good. And at Michael knows this. I have a seven-year-old. She, when she, when I signed her up for daycare, I wrote a person-centered plan and sent it to her, uh, her care providers because she wasn't communicating her needs as well as she does now. And I wanted them to, I knew exactly what everything meant and they were going to have to figure it out. I said, you don't have to worry. If you hear it, go to this, you'll know right away. I love it. Right. Great. Great. Um, go ahead, Brenda. It's also, um, it's also the trend right now, this type of communication, um, not just with children, but also with our seniors. Um, unfortunately, I recently visited several assisted living and memory care type places and um, outside of the residents rooms are what they call a shadow box or a memory box. And inside the shadow box is kind of like a person centered plan. Wow. And it has some information about the resident what they like, a little bit about their history, what they did when they were younger, what are some of their joys moving forward. Um, and so I found myself stopping at everyone's door <laughs> to read about the residents. Um, and that was just so delightful to see and how wonderful that this is now, or, or maybe maybe that started first and then person-centered plan came after the chicken or the egg, I'm not sure. But um, yeah. but I thought well, that I was think, really I think one awesome. of the things we know, yeah, one of the things we know is that person-centered approaches have been around for a very long time, you know, kind of growing out of the, per, the 1970s. And there's a lot of ways that they manifested themselves uh, through supports for people, you know, throughout time. You know, and also through faith communities, sometimes the opposite, but sometimes you see a lot of this kind of approach um, happen in some of the supports that were happening well before the 70s um, for people. But uh, you can see where, you know, I have colleagues that work in aging, that work in end of life, um, that work in um, healthcare, so patient centered care. That's that same kind of um, offshoot, you know, kind of that's been a long slog, you know, in the medical community to get to a point where the patient as partner kind of um, lens is similar to a person-centered lens, right? And uh, and the list goes on, whether you're talking about, you know, uh, my sister works, in, you know, helping people who are formerly incarcerated, you know, kind of re-enter their communities and try and support them. And they use person-centered approaches to do it. You know, we have mental health where you use you know, wellness and recovery action plans or youth wraps and things like that. So this is uh, not new. There's a, you know, education, some of the earliest work around person-centered approaches in the 80s. Um, I know people who are colleagues and friends who were doing that work in schools, but schools can be pretty tough nut to crack, right? So that's why I think it's important um, for all of us to really work together to help move this forward and keep pushing that toothpaste out of the tube um, because, you know, that things will change over time. And I think it's a community of practice approach that makes it uh, sustainable. So the other big thing is the fact that we even have a statewide um, effort. You know, this is a project funded by our New Jersey Department of Education Office of Special, Edu Special Education. Um, and uh, it is statewide. We work statewide. I don't know any other state that has a project like this. I know other states that are doing person-centered work and I have colleagues that do that work but this is a this is important what we're doing but um and it's just I wish we could have you know kind of done more quit more quickly um so hopefully so I think our work really does stand as an example and hopefully will be uh picked up on a broader basis in other states um we have about 15 minutes a little under um, again, if anybody has a question, please put it in there. I wanted to let you know that I put the link for the, um, the Department of Ed's Transition Toolkit. Uh, within that, you'll I'll send I'll I'll find the direct link and I'll put it. Did I see Bill? Was Bill Freeman on this call? Um, I did see Bill, right? I don't know if he's still there, but um, 
I'll find the uh, link and we'll put it uh, we'll put it in the chat. And I also put my email at Rutgers. Uh, so if there's, uh, you know, this I'm not really doing a kind of big PowerPoint thing today. I just wanted to give some basic information. But if you want information about training, um, you know, when you go through our classroom workshop, you know, we're going to share those lessons. So when we go and work with teachers, it's not, you know, when we you, when you do that work, it's not like you're putting so much more on a teacher. You, you're really bringing lessons in. And you know, if you're part of a cohort, we're we're actually coming in and 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 uh, teaching those lessons. So there's a lot uh, during COVID. We had there was kind of two two kind of groups. There was some that were like, oh my God, it's a pandemic. We can't really do anything right now. And then there are others that said, you know what? Oh my God, it's a pandemic. This is exactly what we need to be doing right now, right? So it's like even virtually helping students learn about themselves and each other, you know, we were facilitating that virtually. I'd rather be in a classroom, like I, you know, was with you, Brenda, when we weren't shut shut down during that uh, that bump in, I think, January when things spiked up again. Um, but yeah, so uh, just with regard to, uh, you know, getting back to our conversation, um, I don't know, over time, you know, how do you, I think you talked about this a little bit, Sandra, but I mean, Sometimes we think we're person centered, but then you know the window opens a little wider and we get to look out a little further, right? So I'm just curious how how's person centered approaches impacted you you as an educator over time? Is that a, is that a question that's answerable? <laughs> it's a hard on? one, I think. Yeah. I, I I feel like we always get in our own way sometimes because we feel like mm -hmm. we know the students best. We forget that they have a light life outside of our walls, and while you know, we know them best in, the, in their school life, their parents know them best in their home life, uh, their friends know them best in their social life. So if we are unwilling to hear, you know, sometimes those relationships can be broken in places, but if we're unwilling to hear it and include it, then we aren't getting the whole picture. And I think sometimes depending on the educator that can get in the way. Um, you know, we try to protect our kids a lot. And sometimes we need to allow that protective wall to come down so that we can see all the sides. Um, you know, we always think we know best. Yep. So Great. it's a hard one, but yep. Michael, Couldn't I have to pop of off. Yep. I have to go pick up my daughter from the bus stop. No worries. But, Thank you for sorry. joining us. Any last words, any advice to, uh, Parting advice to educators or, no, or administrators I, I, or others? I, no, I just think if you have not yet done so, definitely get the information. PCAST and Michael has a wealth of knowledge for classroom-based, uh, meeting-based, IEP-based, CST-based, and the, the biggest picture to bring it all together. Um, the kids thrive, the parents thrive, and the relationships between all of the components is just enhanced. And, and almost repairs the broken ones. Um, and, you know, some of the, sometimes IEP meeting environments can be suffocating for everybody, but it definitely brings a different lens to that room. Yeah, there's certainly, it is a healing process, but we definitely, uh, we want to promote this as a proactive, um, you know, kind of strategy rather than a reactive one but uh you know and it's building again. the trust it's building that trust again that we're all here for the same reason in the end yep. all right great thank you thank Sandra. you for inviting me sorry i had to go that's okay thank you we get to pick on brenda then now <laughs> so brett so what do you think brett i mean you know so it, i think you know it doesn't have to be you know kind of the work we've done together i think we you know once we start doing intentional work like this we start to realize the things that were person-centered through our time, kind of what we brought to it, um, but also their systems put you in a, a container of, you know, a box of, uh, you know, as we, people like to say, right? But if you're it's sort of like IEPs, if it's a very, if the process has is heavily sort of um, defined by system needs, um, and it's a continuum, so it's different in different places. But if you're doing that kind of work for 15 years, you start to see students in a certain way. You start to make limiting assumptions about what they can be in that planning process, right? You start to see family members in a certain way, and they see educators in a certain way, 
And when you kind of break that down and start, you know, kind of doing things differently, things can change. But I was uh, curious what, you know, how you felt as a, as a teacher and a good one too. Um, I think, you know, one of the things, or maybe one of the changes that I'm, that I, I would like to make or go going forward is really involving the CST child study team members, yep. because I mean, so many of our CSTs don't know our students. And then here it is, they're leading an IEP and they barely know the kid. They've yep. barely met with them. They, they don't, they really, I don't even know if they know when their birthday is other than reading a, you know, the document. Um, in the soft, it's in the software, Brenda. Right. <laughs> so I'd like CST to get more involved um, so that they feel, feel a little more empowered and that these IEPs aren't so negative, right? Because they, they hear all the goals, the goals. What do we need to work on? What do we, what do we need to do? Um, what are we not doing right? Um, and I think it's so important to focus on the sure. positive and for these parents to hear these wonderful yeah. things. And or to have a balance, right? You know, uh, and be kind of holistic and be receptive. And that's what we, and in fairness to Bridgewater, Raritan, you know, we've had time that we've been allowed, we'll be able to work with and, and train uh, CST members. But I think it takes, it takes a long time to kind of overcome the patterns, right? Of how we are to each other, you know? And so uh, person-centered work goes beyond students, right? It's about how we interact and support each other. Right. So, but go on. Yeah. Sorry. No, it's true. And, it, and, and even, you know, the CST sometimes are responsible for planning their next year, you know, and, and picking classes for them. So it's almost like, well, how can you pick a class if you don't even really know your student? So right. I'm hoping that we can implement um, child study team a little bit more. I don't really know if that's possible because of yeah. their caseload, but um I think they would enjoy their IEP meetings a little bit more yeah. and, um, and maybe to, open their eyes yeah. to a different approach yeah. with parents. And that, speaks to both, that speaks to both how we um, facilitate and teach the lessons that we teach because everything we do, it has an eye on that, um, on the IEP and the students participate in the IEP and among many other things. But I think one of the comments that came in privately was that you know students are sitting in a meeting where um, there are there are a number of this the experience of this person was that there are a number of people there that their child doesn't even know, and what we do know is that you know that's why in person centered practice and person centered planning the student um, actually is supported to select the people they want in their meeting. Now we know that that's not there are other requirements uh, within a system, um, but we have to learn from those experiences, and when we see how different, you know, the, a student can be in that process, you know, what they can bring to it when supported in the right way, you start to realize that, um, and that's what I tell case managers in training, is that, you know, you have a lot of power. If you kind of just do things by default, you know, there's things that can really minimize a student's involvement and the value it brings to that student or to the parent, um, and so we try to, you know, kind of help them, you know, kind of understand how to bring in person-centered facilitation skills and things that can really um, grow a team and make for more collaborative process. And this classroom work is the foundation for a lot of that, which really prepares the student because it starts with them and they really need to be at the, at the front, forefront of it to the extent that they can be. Now, there's a, there are many different kinds of students with different capacities, um, but we want to maximize them. Um, Ralph, I just, we just got a few minutes. Um, just checking my uh, list of secret questions here. Um, is there, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, just that, that question about what this has done for, for you or to you or how you've evolved. And, and then we'll talk about, um, um, Anything we want other people to know as we before we depart. Okay, go ahead. I, real quick, like uh, I, 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 it, it makes me always think about what students are going through, parents are going through as best I possibly could, so to speak. I remember when I uh, when I went into the routine of doing our standard quote PCAST 
And one of my lessons later, years later, uh, there was a, a new class that I went into and I started to remove the desk from the student. And each of my 10 students, I picked up a desk. And by the way, I think I used a week's worth of Bengay on my back because the chair, I didn't know how heavy the desk could be. But anyway, I moved it away and I said, wow, this is what we're doing in PCAS is a process of removing some of the barriers. And it was very symbolic, metaphorically, so to speak. Yep. But it, this is the PCAS process. We're removing yep. some of the academic barriers. And we're looking at, not at careers, we're going to start the career journey with you. We're doing self-exploration. We're doing to help you with self-awareness. And that's the whole process of PCAS. Yeah. Um, the desk was maybe a little exaggeration on my part, but... It's part of the process. Yeah, and there are a lot, and you know that's how we approach it in, in every in every way, whether it's in the classroom or in uh, individual facilitated meetings. Um, we we try and work collectively, um, collaboratively, and co-creating um, approaches that remove both uh, barriers, literal and figurative. Right. So um, there's a lot of ways that we try to create environments that work for people. Uh, for everyone, and it's and they work better for educators, right? So that's always the feedback that we get. So the you know the obstacles, the you know the pitfalls, the, the challenges, and the struggles, they're all there. Um, but in in a community practice, you have you know you got your your wing people, right? We got we kind of move through them together, and we get, and we are able to celebrate and learn and gather um, and harvest them, you know, kind of wisdom and information and share it with each other. So that's one of the great things about it. So I want to give you all just, um, we have one minute. Um, I'm just going to give you anything you want to say, uh, as we depart. And I want to let everyone know out there, if there's anything you want to know, I'm happy to help. I know we have a couple of classroom trainings coming up. One's on October 14th. And I, I think there may be room still, you registered the link that I put, um, but you can go to the Bog Center, um, at Rutgers, but Rutgers Bog Center, PCAST, and you're gonna find us uh, in Google regardless. So um, Brenda, you wanna, anything, any parting words of wisdom, anything you'd like to share? I just wanna thank you, but um, as we close out. Um, I think if, if there's something I could share is to start it as early as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you came in last year and I had some students that were already post-grads. So there was like this rush to hurry, fill it all in. This kid's going to graduate. I got to get it done. Um, yeah. so well, it's, um, it is, it's lifelong, right? So even then it's, this is yeah. lifelong work, but, so but yeah, I, do I, whatever you can to start in any small way, even. Yeah. I'm sure. hopeful to, um, you know, get started with the ninth and 10th graders so that they can you know, work on this process. And then the other thing I would do is maybe establish a Gmail account that's outside of the district, you know, with, with the parents' support so that um, once they graduate, there's already a Gmail account established that we can send that PCAT, finished PCAST to their drive or their, their new Gmail. And then they'll have that ability to edit it moving forward throughout their 20s you know and so, yeah we should start doing uh, you know if you're not doing that already the same thing when we facilitate a plan is it gets emailed immediately to the to the student and the family we can do that to, you can do that in the classroom as well we gotta we're, i'm just gonna really briefly ralph anything you want to say we just got um we're already over by a minute or two I'm sorry so i want to thank you michael and my colleagues and dawn especially to bringing us here uh, to pass the word of PCAS because it's a very powerful force and people like your organization and what you're doing is wonderful. So thank you yep. for the opportunity. Great, great. Thank you uh, to Sandra, Ralph, and Brenda. Always a joy um, working with you and I appreciate you jumping on this to just kind of share some of your experiences. Don, thank you for having yes, us. Yes, and we want to thank you, Michael, um, bringing your group here. This is wonderful. Um, you put your information in the chat. So if anybody has any questions, um, they can always reach out to you. 
Um, we also Absolutely. want to say that the workshop recordings will be made available on our website in November for those in need of proof of attendance and continuing education credits. You'll receive an email soon with your certificate, and it's up to your employer to accept this as proof of continuing education. You will not receive your uh, certificate if you do not register using that form that we put in the chat box. So thank you everyone so much. And everyone else, please take advantage of we have a week long of workshops. So we hope to see everyone again. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. It was wonderful to hear all of you speak of what great work you're doing. So thank you so much. Yes, indeed. Thank you and have a wonderful conference. I'm looking forward to uh, sneaking in and catching some of these uh, presentations. So I appreciate it. Great. Bye-bye now. Uh, take care. Bye-bye, everyone.